name, to hear your holy word, to confess our sins, and to hear your absolution of peace. Grant us your Holy Spirit, so that you might fill us with the breath and power of your resurrection, that we might live before you all our days here in this life with the sure hope of life eternal through your Son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. We'll sing him 457, which is the children's hymn again this week. The order of service this morning is taken from Divine Service Setting 2. I want to print it in your bulletin as well, beginning on page 2. Please rise. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. 
Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways through the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Like newborn infants, long for the pure spiritual milk of the word, that by it you may grow up into salvation, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. O oh, give thanks to the Lord, call upon his name, make known his deeds among the peoples. Sing to him, sing praises to him, tell of all his wondrous works, glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Seek the Lord and his strength, seek his presence continually. Remember the wondrous works that he has done, his miracles and the judgments he uttered. He remembers his covenant forever, the word that he commanded for a thousand generations. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above, and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. This is the feast of victory for our God. Almighty God, grant that we who have celebrated the Lord's resurrection may by your grace confess in our life and conversation that Jesus is Lord and God, 
Through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Our first reading this morning, the second Sunday of Easter, is from Acts chapter 5, verses 12 through 32. Now many signs and wonders were regularly done among the people by the hands of the apostles, and they were all together in Solomon's portico. None of the rest dared join them, but the people held them in high esteem. And more than ever, believers were added to the Lord multitudes of both men and women, so that even so that they even carried out the sick into the streets and laid them on cots and mats that as Peter came by, at least his shadow might fall on some of them. The people also gathered from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing the sick and those afflicted with unclean spirits, and they were all healed. But the high, priests rose, oh, sorry, the high priest rose up, and all who were with him, that is, the party of the Sadducees, and filled with jealousy, they arrested the apostles and put them in public prison, but during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the prison doors and brought them out and said, Go and stand in the temple and speak to the people all the words of this life. And when they heard this, they entered the temple at daybreak and began to teach. Now when the high priest came and those who were with him, they called together the council and all the senate of Israel and sent to the prison to have them brought. But when the officers came, they did not find them in prison. So they returned and reported, We found the prison securely locked. And the guards standing at the doors, but when we opened them, we found no one inside. Now when the captain of the temple and the chief priests heard these words, they were greatly perplexed about them, wondering what this would come to. And someone came and told them, look, the men whom you put in prison are standing in the temple and teaching the people. Then the captain with the officers went and brought them, but not by force, for they were afraid of being stoned by the people. And when they had brought them, they set them before the council. And the high priest questioned them, saying, We strictly charged you not to teach in this name. Yet here you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching, and you intend to bring this man's blood upon us. But Peter and the apostles answered, We must obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised Jesus, whom you killed by hanging him on a tree. God exalted him at his right hand as leader and savior to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are witnesses to these things. And so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We'll read Psalm 148 responsively. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the heights. Praise him, all his angels. Praise him, all his hosts. Praise him, sun and moon. Praise him. Praise him, you highest heavens. And you waters above the heavens. Let them praise the name of the Lord. For he commanded and they were created. And he established them forever and ever. He gave a decree and they shall not pass away. Praise the Lord from the earth. You great sea creatures and all beasts. Fire and hail, snow and mist. Stormy wind fulfilling. Mountains and all hills, fruit trees and all cedars, beasts and all livestock, creeping things and flying birds, kings of the earth and all peoples, princes and all rulers of the earth, young men and maidens together, old men and children. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is exalted. His majesty is above all. He has raised up a horn for his people. Praise for all his saints. For the people of Israel who are near to him, praise the Lord. Our epistle reading is from yeah. Revelation chapter 1, verses 4 through 18. John, to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings on earth. 
to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom, priests to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he is coming with the clouds and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And all tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. Even so, amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. I, John, your brother and partner in the tribulation and the kingdom and the patient endurance that are in Jesus, was on the island called Patmos on account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet saying, write what you see in a book and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus and to Smyrna and to Pergamum and to Thyatira and to Sardis and to Philadelphia and to Laodicea. Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me, and on turning, I saw seven golden lampstands and in the midst of the lampstands, one like a son of man, clothed with a long robe and with a golden sash around his chest. The hairs of his head were white like wool, as white as snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze refined in a furnace, and his voice was like the roar of many waters. In his right hand, he held seven stars. From his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun shining in full strength. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. But he laid his right hand on me saying, fear not, I am the first and the last and the living one. I died and behold, I am alive forevermore and I have the keys of death and Hades. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please arise for the gospel reading. Alleluia. We know that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Alleluia. <laughs> Gospel according to St. John, the 20th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of anyone, they are forgiven. If you withhold forgiveness from anyone, it is withheld. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord but he said to them, unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails and place my finger into the mark of the nails and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve but believe. Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the, of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. We'll sing him 464. <laughs>
We pray. O oh Lord, to whom else shall we go? You alone have the words of eternal life. Amen. Dearly beloved, gathered with Jesus Christ in the midst of you, grace and peace to you. Everyone was there, and everyone was talking. Did you see him? We did too, but we didn't know it was him. We walked all the way to Emmaus, and he was teaching us the scriptures, and we didn't even recognize him until he broke the bread in front of us, and then he was gone. We just ran back here. Did you guys say Peter saw him? And Mary? And where's the other Mary? And, and the other Mary? And what did you say the women said, the angels said? And what do you think it all means? And are we going to see him again? And then, shh, keep it down. The Jews might still be looking for us. And silence. As every eye shifted to the center of the room, there he was. How did he get in? Aren't the doors locked? Is this just a figment of our imagination? Is, it, is he a ghost? And then he said it. Peace to you. And he showed them his hands in his side. He had them at hello. And the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord, just as he had told them. You will see me again, and your hearts will rejoice. It was a sight they would never forget. Later, John wrote, That which was from the beginning which we have heard, which our eyes have looked upon, which we have touched with our hands concerning the word of life. And then he said it again, that word of life. Peace to you. The next week, they were gathered once more, probably in the same place, the same day of the week, Fightings and fears within and without. The doors again locked. This time, Thomas with them, with all of his pessimistic, pessimistic, it's too good to be true and I'll never believe it doubt. And the rest of the disciples, probably with some doubts and misgivings still of their own. And then there he was, again, standing in the midst of them, forgiving fears, relieving doubts. And it's the same today. Here you are, gathered like they were then, as Christians have been gathering for 2,000 years on the first day of the week, the day when, like the golden sun ascending Christ, the light of life vanquished the night of death. You gather just like them. There are doubts and fears and failings, and your hearts and minds are worries and wonderings. There is weakness and sorrow, anger, pessimism. And here he stands again where two or three are gathered in my name, he says. There I am in the midst of them. Here, where you have called on his name, he stands, just as he did then, in the power of his resurrection, proclaiming the peace of his resurrection. You know, the, the scriptures describe various modes of Christ's presence. That's the term that dogmaticians like to use, the modes of Christ's presence. What it means is, different ways in which he can be present in a certain place. There is what is called the heavenly mode, meaning the sense in which, as God, he is above and beyond all things. There is what's called the illocal mode, that is, that he fills all things, not taking up space within them, but permeating all things. Like, you could say Jesus is in this pulpit, but he is not the pulpit. And the pulpit is not him. There's also his mystical presence. That's, what we, that's a term we use to refer to the way that he dwells in your hearts by faith, the hearts of believers. Then there's his sacramental presence, meaning the way that he's present in the Lord's Supper. He says, this is my body and this is my blood, and so we believe he's there, but we can't like quantify it or write an equation to describe it, so we just say, well, that's the sacramental presence. That's the way he's here in the sacrament. And then there's what's called the local mode, the bodily mode. This is the one that you're most familiar with because this is the one that you have. Meaning that your body is in one particular place taking up space. You're here and you're not there. That's why uh, if you were ever accused of some crime and you were at trial, one thing you might try to do in order to prove your innocence would be to show that you were in a different place when the crime was committed because you can't be two places at once unless you have an identical twin and faked it, right? So this mode of presence is one that Jesus took on when he became a man and confined himself in his earthly body 
to this. Even though he sometimes used his divine power in his human life, he always confined himself to you know, one place, one space, and that sort of thing. And even in his resurrection, he still can use this particular mode of presence. We, we saw him doing this. In the resurrection appearances, he stood behind Mary. He walked with the Emmaus disciples. He appeared in the midst of the disciples. And yet, there's something a little strange about all of these appearances. Something that we in our physical local body cannot do. He is appearing and disappearing, apparently out of thin air. Or maybe passing through walls or whatever it is he's doing. And yet, it's really him. Really there with a physical body. And maybe he says, touch my hands and my side. I'm not a ghost. And the reason I'm mentioning all this to you is because the appearances of Jesus in his resurrection, showing all these ways in which he could be present, they emphasize the power of his resurrection. The power of the one who has gained victory over death. You see it in the marks. You know, Jesus has such marks in his hands and side that he can invite Thomas to put his finger in the holes, in his hand, in the side. Imagine if you know, somebody came up to you and was like, dude, I just put a nail through my hand. Check it out. You want to put your finger in there? You'd be like, no, that's gross. It's, it's bloody. If you put your hand in there, you'd probably feel some like bone and you'd probably think you were hurting them. And that, that's pretty grotesque, right? Now, you probably have shown people scars before and told the story of how you got them. Like here, where I shot myself with an arrow, or here where my brother hit me with a knife. But Jesus does not have either of those things. The marks in his hands and side are not scars. They're not lines on his skin where a hole used to be, nor are they open, gaping, grotesque wounds with like blood oozing out or anything like that. No, these are marks of his glory. His body, by choice, still bears these marks. And just by looking at them, you'd be able to tell, well, this is not normal. And that's to remind the disciples, to remind you and I, that this is the one who died. The book of Revelation talks about him this way. It says he was standing as a lamb as though it had been slain. Had been. Or as he said in our reading, I am he who was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Those are the marks of his power, of the power of his resurrection and his victory over sin and death and hell. These marks are there to declare the power of his resurrection to you. And this is important to remember as we consider the way in which Jesus is with us today. Because you might read our story of Jesus appearing to Thomas him showing his hands inside and think, you know, I, I wish he would show that to me. Then, then you know, I, I could be even more confident. But Jesus kind of hedges that off. He says, blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. He doesn't want you to think that you're missing out. He doesn't want you to think that he's coming to you in a lesser way. He's saying a great gift has been given to you to believe. He's saying, I am still coming to you. Yeah, it's not in that local mode, this physical presence. He could if he wanted to. If Jesus wanted to, he could appear in the midst of every gathering of believers throughout the world in a physical body at the same time. He can be in more than one place at once in his glorious resurrection. Instead, he's determined to be known through the gospel in word and sacrament. And that's the way that he promises to come among you in the preaching of the word in his body and blood, in with and under the bread and wine and the sacrament, in your hearts by faith, in the power of his spirit, which is there in the word that he speaks to you. In all of these ways, he is really and truly here. And he is here as all that he is. He hasn't come to you in a lesser way, just a different way. Wherever Jesus comes, he comes with all the power of his resurrection, with all of his life, and therefore, with all the power of his peace. We desperately need that. See, week after week goes by, and quickly we forget these things. We forget about his power and his peace, just like the disciples did. There they were, gathered just one week later. They had seen Jesus. They knew it was him. And yet, again, the doors are locked. 
undoubtedly for the same reason, for fear of the Jews. And it's understandable. This wasn't some paranoia they had. Some of them would later be murdered by the Jews. They would be threatened and persecuted by them. We read about one of those occasions in our reading from the book of Acts. But Jesus had shown them that he lived, and yet still they were afraid. It's the same with us, isn't it? We too are weak and doubting and sinful. Perhaps sometimes you have, you have doubts kind of like Thomas, thinking that it's too good to be true, or listening to the you know, rational arguments of skeptics and thinking, oh, maybe they have a point and maybe this is ridiculous and maybe it was just a myth and maybe it's just a story and whatever else. Maybe you just feel like it can't be true and, and you're, the way you feel leads you to have some doubts. Maybe you have fears, fears that it won't matter or fears that it won't be able to conquer death or fears that you're not, you're not good enough for Jesus, that and it won't apply to you because of that. Or, or fears of the world which cause you to keep yourself locked away from the world and your confession locked away in your heart. Or maybe, even at times, you sort of have an opposite approach. Maybe you look at Th Thomas and his doubt and think, oh, that's not me, you know. I never really have doubts like that. You know, I just must have a much stronger faith than Thomas. If you ever think that way, watch out. Because it's not true. Yes, Thomas had doubts. And Thomas was a believer. Just the other week, when Jesus told the disciples that they were going to go in order to see Lazarus, and the disciples were saying, that's crazy, you know, that's your Jerusalem, the Jews have been trying to kill you. Thomas said, let us also go, that we may die with him. This was a believer. He had faith, the faith that Christ had given him, the same faith that Christ gives you, and he also had doubts. And this is a pivotal moment for him. It's a point where his doubt and his faith Come to a head, and the faith that Jesus gives wins. Jesus calls him to that faith. But my point is this. Thomas had doubt because he had a sinful flesh. The disciples, the rest of them, they weren't any better. I mean, they had heard the reports from the women on Easter morning, and they hadn't believed them either. They figured it was a bunch of old women talking. We all have such doubts because we all have a sinful flesh. And if you ever feel like you don't have sinful doubts, well, it's because your sinful flesh is trying to lay a trap for you. Its goal, the devil's goal, is to bring you to, into unbelief. And he can do that through doubts. He can do that through racking you with, with guilt and fear. And he can do it through false confidence. To think that you've got it all figured out and you're just a much stronger Christian than, than Thomas, one of the apostles that Jesus called. In all of this, we're reminded of our weakness, of our fear, and of our doubt. And that is why Jesus comes and stands in the midst of them and says to them over and over, peace be with you. He doesn't insult Thomas for his doubt. He doesn't even really berate him. He says, do not be unbelieving, but believe him and calls him to faith. He does the same with you. He speaks his peace again and again because he knows how often we need to hear it. He speaks peace to fear and to doubt and to guilt. I mean, just think about it. Jesus' peace is here to overcome your doubts. This isn't a place for those who think they've got it all together. He calls you here with your doubts and guilts and fears. And the peace of the power of his resurrection overcomes them. He said it in our text. These are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. Romans says faith comes through hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. What he is saying is that his word has an even greater power to bring you to faith, to relieve your doubts, than his physical appearance among the disciples. Because remember, wherever he comes, he comes with all that he is. He comes with all the power of his resurrection. That is all in his word. There is power there also to give you peace in the midst of your guilt. Being a Christian doesn't mean your sins stop. You have a sinful nature for the same reason that Thomas had doubts. So you will keep sinning. Week after week will go by and you'll get distracted and you'll, for you'll, you'll forget and you'll have weaknesses and failings. And he invites you here. And he comes and he stands in your midst, in the midst of sinners. And he proclaims his peace, the peace of the forgiveness of sins. And he emphasizes how sure this forgiveness is in our text. He breathes on them. 
and says, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. Realize what that means. It means that when earlier in the service and here in the sermon, when, when I declare to you that your sins are forgiven, it's not me saying that. It's Jesus. If Jesus told you, wouldn't you believe? If Jesus stood and showed you his hands and sides, what peace that would give. That is what is happening. He is here with all that he is, with all the power of his resurrection. That power that gives the peace and the forgiveness of sins. That's true when you say it to one another, too, as Christians. To a spouse, to a child, to a friend, to a parent. You can say, your sins are forgiven. And it's true. Just as if Jesus himself were standing there and saying it. Because that word of peace has the power of the spirit of his resurrection. Do you notice what he did? He breathes on them. He's, he's mimicking God's original act of the creation of man. Because he is the one who created man. And as he breathed into Adam's nostrils the breath of life and he became a living being. So Christ in his resurrection, Paul writes in Corinthians, has become a life breathing spirit. His word, he says, is spirit and life. The peace of the forgiveness of sins gives life to you in soul and in body. And this also means, Paul writes in Romans, that if the spirit of the one who raised Jesus from the dead is within you, then certainly he will also raise your bodies. And that is why there is peace in every fear. The disciples' fear, as I mentioned, wasn't unfounded. And Jesus didn't come to them and say, you know, peace to you, it's all right. I wouldn't killed all the Jewish leaders who were trying to kill you, and they're all gone, and you wouldn't have to worry about those guys anymore. No, he said, as the Father has sent me, so also I am sending you into persecution, into death. But his peace means that there's nothing to fear. What's the worst thing people can do to you? Well, they could kill you. Sounds pretty bad. Until you remember that Jesus stands in your midst with the marks of his suffering. He stands as the one with the power over death and sin and hell. He says, behold, I am alive forevermore and I have the keys of death and of Hades. I have destroyed hell's walls. I have conquered all of its power. I've ripped apart the grave and you will live forever. And his resurrection promises that you will have a resurrection like his. That power of his resurrection that we were talking about the amazing things that he did, appearing and disappearing, the strength that he showed. Paul says that Jesus will transform your lowly bodies to be like his glorious body. That this new creation in eternal life, that this resurrection is a resurrection of power. Not a resurrection to just like, oh, another 80 years where your body slowly falls apart. Not even a resurrection to be like Adam in the beginning, but to be better than Adam in the beginning more powerful, stronger, enduring, eternal in Jesus Christ. This is the power that gives peace. You know, it really is only power that can give peace because of all the evil in the world. You know, you might remember Teddy Roosevelt's famous quote, speak softly and carry a big stick. That was his motto for diplomacy. He wasn't trying to pick fights with anybody, but he wanted people to know, don't try to pick a fight with us. We've, we've got a, a big stick. Jesus' power is what brings peace. His power over sin and death and hell brings peace to you in fear and guilt and doubt. You know, the Japanese have a saying, a man is whatever room he is in. And I suppose it's true of us in various ways. We often kind of change who we are based on what's around us and who is around us. But what about Jesus? If a man is whatever room he is in, this Jesus is the one who stands in every room. The Jesus who stood before Pilate is the Jesus who went into the grave and left it empty. It's the Jesus who appeared in the midst of his disciples, the Jesus who's at the right hand of the throne of God, the Jesus who appears in the midst of his people throughout the world, wherever two or three are gathered in his name and unites them in his holy Christian church. This is the Jesus that stands among you. And wherever Jesus is, he is with all he is. So if a person is whatever room they are in, then Christians live as those who live in Christ with all his power 
with all his peace. Amen. And now, the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Please arise, we'll confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated, and we'll continue by singing our next hymn. Uh, The service in the bulletin is not correct from this point on. We'll be singing him 470, verses 1 and 4 through 8. 1 and 4 through 8.
Heavenly Father, we thank you that through the example of Thomas, you have given us a word that we can trust. Through the witness of all the apostles who first doubted and afterwards were convinced, you gave us trustworthy eyewitnesses. You gave us the word that you inspired them to preach. You gave us your sacrament. You gave us your baptism. You gave us all of this, and in it you pour out your spirit upon us so that we might believe and continue in faith and life everlasting. Lord, keep your promises to us. Fill us with that spirit. Fill us with your love and with your life that we may live what it means to live in you. That we might follow you on the way to life eternal. That we might confess your name before the world. And that we might show your love in all we do. Help this Easter joy and Easter life to fill our lives in everything we do. In all of the work that you give us to do. When we have doubts or fears or sorrows or guilt, comfort us with your peace. When we feel weak, fill us with your power. Bless the preaching of your gospel here and throughout the world. That the light of your resurrection may spread to every quarter of the sin-darkened earth. Bless the leaders of the world, Lord. Give them understanding and help them to lead, to lead wisely and well. Bring an end to wars wherever they are. And most importantly, Lord, use all things, including those wars and plagues and various troubles, to spread your kingdom, to bring people to the only hope that exists in this world, the hope of a new world to come in Jesus Christ, our Savior. Help us to trust in him as our first fruits from the dead, knowing that we will follow where he has gone. Lord, bless all of those who can be with us this morning. Comfort their hearts in whatever troubles they face. Bless those who are sick and suffering. Give healing in their bodies, Lord, and faith in their hearts. Especially we pray for Don Vickham, for Kaylee Udy. We ask for your blessing upon all those whom we remember before you, Lord. And all throughout the world who have doubts and troubles and fears, comfort them and, and lead them to know that here is the place for all such sinners as we ourselves are, so that you stand in the midst of them and give them your peace. We ask all of these things confident that you will hear us and answer through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Please rise and we'll sing the offertory. That's on page 11 of your book. What shall I final hymn in 465.
Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. And as always, joy to be with you and share in the news of Christ's victory over death. Thank you, Michael, for playing. It's all right. Um, Borders meeting here shortly after the service. Sunday school is playing. Yeah, perfect. Um, see, there's a few other things in the bulletin. We've got the you know numbers from the council and voters meetings there. Um, announcement about the play at Emanuel. I, I think that's got to be that's for April 29th and 30th. That's this weekend. That's got to be. I did see an announcement about Visitors Day, but it's got to be. It's always on Visitors Day, unless they changed it. Visitors Day is this upcoming weekend. That's this one. Yeah, the same, same one that's talking about with this play. So, um, I don't think I have anything else specifically. Do have announcements? We will plan on. Uh, next week, by the way, starting um, a Bible study again. And hopefully we'll be starting that, that new series we, we talked about doing on uh, different uh, current issues and events and things like that. So we'll look forward to seeing you there. Lord, be with you.